um, thank you all for coming. Uh, the happy birthday part, um, it is a milestone year for me. 2024 is the 30th anniversary of the publication of the first Jack Switek novel, which came out in 1994. Yeah, so it's a big deal. Um, and, uh, and it's been pretty much a book a year uh, ever since then. This is the 31st novel, the 18th um, in the series. So I thought, since it's an anniversary year, that I would just kind of take you all down a little bit of a, a walk down memory lane here. Okay, so this is what launched the book, the first book, believe it or not, People Magazine. Um, so this is back when people actually read magazines, I guess now. Uh, and even better, uh, I made it into the best dressed issue, um, best and worst dressed. I was not worst dressed. I wasn't, but, um, they, um, the book, this came out like in September of 94 book came out September, middle of September. Um, and I was at the time, uh, a practicing attorney. Uh, I was working for a very large firm in, um, uh, downtown Miami. In fact, that photograph from People Magazine is in the lobby of the building where I worked. And um, uh, when the book came out, you know, I was still practicing. So I would be at the courthouse or I'd be in the office and people would sort of say, you know, how's the book going? And I would, you know, it was very exciting. It was, you know, to see your book in a bookstore after, you know, you've been dreaming about it all these years. and. Um, uh, you know, if I'd see people in the courthouse that they would be, you know, or uh, at the office, they'd be, you know, want daily updates. And but it was interesting because usually the conversation would end with something like this. They would say, well, are you going to continue to practice law? And I had no plan to stop. I had wanted to be a lawyer since I was in the eighth grade. And I said, well, yeah, I'm going to still practice law. And the response would be something along the lines of, gee, I'm really sorry. I hope your next book does better. <laughs> so, so, I mean, in the, op the idea there was that, you know, wh why would someone write a book other than to um, stop their day job, right? So you can quit your day job. But that wasn't my goal. Um, I actually started writing... I mentioned 1994 is the anniversary year, but I started writing in the late 80s. Um, and the hottest show on television, well, who can name it? You know, the, the hottest drama on television in the late 80s. No, that's, uh, well, actually it was late 80s, wasn't it? But that was not it. Um, it was a legal show, L.A. Law, L.A. Law, right? And so... You know, either, uh, and the hottest book in the country was a book written by another lawyer named Scott Turow. Did somebody say it? Presumed Innocent. Presumed Innocent. It became a movie with Harrison Ford and all of that. So, um, so those two things, I was a young lawyer, sort of, you know, with my goal in life, always to be a writer, be a lawyer, but the the dream was to be a writer. And I thought either arrogantly or naively, you know, well, I can do that. You know, the, the L.A. law stick or presumed innocence. So I started writing nights and weekends um, for about four and a half years. Um, and what was interesting about that, who here is, be honest, have you ever tried to write a novel? A few people have. A few people have. And so for the couple who will admit that they actually tried to write a novel, you'll know that the hardest thing to do is to actually let somebody else read it. Because as long as it's a secret, your dream is alive, you know, but you put it out there and finally somebody tells you, yeah, you know, not so good. You know, uh, you know, that, that that's a dream killer. Um, so around 1990 or so, um, while, you know, my routine was this, basically. It was, you know, get up, get into the office by, seven. this is back when you had to go to the office. Not only go to the office, but you had to wear a coat and tie to the office. Now it's, you know, young lawyers don't even go into the office, let alone put on a coat and tie. 
So um, I'd get in about eight, I'd stay till about eight, I would come home, eat, and then I would write, you know, uh, nights and weekends. That was sort of my lifestyle. Um, until finally, I just said, somebody's got to read this, right? And so I, um, uh, <laughs> I let my closest friends read it, which is kind of like asking your mother if she thinks you're handsome or something, you know, right? So, um, and they all encouraged me. This is like, wow, this is really good. You should try to get this published. I had no idea how to get published, um, but I learned you needed a literary agent. So I sent my manuscript off to, about this time, there was a guy who came, you may have heard of him, John Grisham, okay? Uh, he, uh, he, was a, he was, you know, the firm was catching fire at that point in time. Um, and agents were actively looking for lawyers who could write. It was the hot genre. Um, and so I sent it to Grisham's agent, never heard from him. I sent it to Robert Ludlum's agent who actually wrote back, um, not so nice, but he wrote back um, and said, um, basically, um, your first novel should be no more than 90,000 words. And so I went back to my computer and realized, okay, this manuscript that I've been working on for four years was 226,000 words long. I had put everything into this story um, and it was a disaster. Um, and until I heard from um, a guy named Artie Pine. Um, Artie had been around forever. Artie got his start doing publicity work for George Burns to give you an idea of how long he'd been around, right? And so Artie <clears throat> called me and said, you know what, this needs a shave and a haircut, which was much kinder than I, I think Ludlum's agent said it was terminally obese, it was, uh, was his remark. Artie said it needs a shave and a haircut. So I'm like, okay, that's cool, I can, I can work with that. So I spent another year um, whipping this thing, cutting it and revising it under Artie's guidance. Um, and it was set in Palm Beach County. It had something to do with the sugar industry. Um, I've got my, but unfortunately, um, as, as bullish as Artie was on that story, finally he just, you know, it was August of 92. Was anybody here living in South Florida in 1992? So yeah, I mean, un until recently, 92 was the worst hurricane we would had, Hurricane Andrew. So my girlfriend, who's now my wife, um, her house was destroyed, her parents' house was destroyed, her grandmother's house was destroyed. They were all living with me um, in a two-bedroom townhouse. When this came, um, August 17, 1992, my last rejection letter, I already said, I have knocked on every door in New York, and I'm sorry, nobody wants this book. So I'm like, well, that sucks, but uh, you know, I gave it a shot. That's Artie. Um, this is at a place called Pete's in Boca Raton, way, way, way back. Maybe some of you, I don't even know if it's still there or not, but it's not, okay. Okay, so um, that's my daughter. Uh, uh, and um, Artie being, you know, he was the eternal optimist, right? He was the shave and the haircut instead of terminally obese, but he was also, he actually wrote a book called when a door closes, a window opens. Um, and we've all heard that expression, but Artie lived it, right? And he um, called me a couple weeks after he sent me this last rejection letter and said, you know, Jim, I've been thinking about this book and you got the most encouraging rejection letters I have ever seen. <laughs> So, and I thought, wow, well, that's a great spin. But he, he said, basically, your problem was you had this 250,000 word monster in a box and you tried to fix it. Just try again. You know, try, just go clean slate. Don't try to fix something that's broken. And so, you know, but already had that gift, right, to make 
you think that that's a great idea. Okay, I just spent four years writing a novel for rejection, and suddenly it's a great idea. I'm going to start all all over again. Um, and so uh, I used to think um, writer's block was a myth. I thought it was like an excuse people would use because they just couldn't didn't want to focus or something, but. I spent the next month doing that same routine, getting up in the morning, staying late at the office, r trying to write at night, but um, nothing was coming. I was staring at a blank com computer screen, um, which is logical if you think about it. I mean, I, had, I was afraid to start down the wrong path, right? Because I had gone down the wrong path and it cost me four years of effort and revision for nothing. So I had no story um, until um, one night um, about in October. Um, so um, I get, a, I, I'm up and it's like one o'clock in the morning and I'm staring at this blank screen and I go um, for a walk. Um, and a police car pulls up on this whale. The cop jumps out, stops me, and demands to know, where are you going? And I'm thinking, you know, I'm a young lawyer. I'm thinking, you know, this is America, you know, and all of that. But it's one in the morning and he's, you know, I don't, I'm just being polite. And so I said, well, um, actually, I live around here and I'm just out for a walk. Uh, and he said, well, do you have any identification? I guess he wanted to see if I actually lived around there. And I didn't. I was dressed in jogging shorts and a T-shirt. Had nothing with me. Um, and I said, no, uh, you know, I don't. I'm sorry. He said, well, I need you to wait right here because there's been a report of a peeping Tom in the neighborhood. I'm like, oh, God, great. So, um, and I've got to be in the office, you know, in six hours. So um, I'm, I'm waiting, um, standing outside the police car, and I can hear the radio dispatcher describe the guy they're looking for, the peeping Tom. And she says, um, white male under six feet tall, brown hair, brown eyes, mid thirties. I'm thinking, wow, this sounds really like me. Um, and uh, wearing a white t-shirt, I was wearing a white t-shirt uh, and blue shorts and I had on blue shorts and I'm thinking, I'm going to jail. Um, and finally she adds, and a mustache. And I breathe a sigh of the relief. The cop is staring at me, thinking maybe, I guess, you know, could, did he have a phony mustache? Or could someone in the shadows have thought he had a mustache and he didn't actually have a mustache? And we stared at each other for, it seemed like forever. And finally, he just says, go home. And I'm watching this squad car pull away. And I'm thinking, but for a mustache? I'm, I'm in the back of that car, right? And I would have had to call my partners at the law firm and say, you know, oh, can you come down? Yeah, uh, well, peeping Tom is the charge, you know? And, and this, of course, would have been in the newspapers and my life would have changed, uh, not for the better. Um, so um, what I did, though, is... Um, uh, I need to write about this. And I knew the Peeping Tom lawyer was not going to be a bestseller. But I, um, I had done some death penalty work um, right out of law school. And so I do what thriller writers do. That's my genre, suspense, thrillers. And I went home that night and I wrote all night a scene about a guy on death row, hours away from execution that he may not have committed. And if you were to pick up The Pardon, which is the first in the series, The Pardon, um, you would read what I wrote that night. Um, uh, and that stuck. And then I had my idea. I finished, finished, the, finished the book in about six or seven months. I already sold it to HarperCollins in a weekend. Um, I'm now represented by Artie's son. Artie's no longer with us, but I'm still with the same publisher, um, HarperCollins, 30 years later um, on my 31st novel. So, and this is a place, this was my first book signing um, at a 
bookstore called Books and Books um, in Miami. Uh, um, and I'm um, and I'll be there this Friday. So if you have friends in Miami, spread the word. So um, so anyway, I wrote uh, the first Jack Switek novel, um, uh, and he. It, I came up with this father-son story of Jack is the, you know, sort of an idealistic young lawyer, defends death row inmates. His father is the law and order governor of Florida. He's signing the death warrants of people that Jack represents. Jack finally has a, a client who he believes is actually innocent. Um, and um, I thought I wrapped up the story pretty well. I did not intend it to be a series. So I, you know, that book did really well. It launched my career. Um, you saw the People Magazine thing and all of that. So, um, and I moved on. I wrote um, five, when, is that five? Yeah, five more novels that had nothing to do with Jack Switek, right? Um, and then I'd say around 2000, um, people started writing you know, and about Jack, they'd say, you know, really interesting character. He was a young guy. He had so much, you know, uh, you know, so much more we want to know about him. Would you, you know, and, and so my editor, Carolyn Marino, and I had, by the way, I had the same, my, my wife loves it. She thinks I'm like the most monogamous guy in the business, right? You know, it's like uh, same agent, same publisher uh, for 30 novels. Um, and I had the same editor until she retired for 26 of the novels. So Carolyn Marino, it was really her idea. She said, you should go back to Jack, um, you know, and so we did, you know, and which is really hard because that was eight years gap, you know, and so there were very difficult questions that I had to answer, like, how am I going to fill in that eight years? Or am I just going to pretend like the eight years didn't happen and the next book will be he's 29 instead of 28 and all that. Um, will he age, you know, in the series? That's a big decision to make. Um, you know, is it going to be, you know, James Bond and 35 forever, or are you going to, you know, age the character? Um, so anyway, and I, uh, beyond suspicion, even though the pardon technically is the first one in the series, beyond suspicion in 2002 is the first book I really wrote knowing that Jack was going to be um, a part of a series. And so, because it also introduced his sidekick, Theo Knight, right? And um, so J Theo Knight actually is um, the only client Jack represented on death row who was um, innocent. And so Jack um, and Theo forged this friendship, which has endured to this day in the series. It's He's probably, other than Jack, probably the people's readers' most favorite character in the in the series, um, because Theo lives his life, you know, making up for lost time. He spent four years on death row for a murder he didn't commit. So anything worth doing is worth overdoing. Is sort of his his way. And his favorite drink is tequila without training wheels, which means no lemon and no salt. So, um, so. Um, I'm going to preempt some questions here because I do want to. I want to leave time at the end for questions, but one that everybody always asks: So, is this an autobi? Uh, uh, is this autobiographical? Right? Is Jack you? Um, so, definitely not the father son part of it. There's there is that tension between Jack and his father from the get go in the pardon. You know, Jack's dad was the law and order governor of Florida. Um, I used to have this as my first line on my, uh, my website. My dad was a stripper. Um, he actually was, that's technically the term for when you, for in the printing industry, they're called strippers. They, they, they create the, um, the, the printing line, right. For the, for whatever they're printing. So, um, so, and, and, uh, I was very close to my dad till the day he died. Um, my mother you know, Jack's mom, um, that one interesting part of the series is that Jack is half Hispanic, but he was raised in a gringo family, right? He is because his mother died when he was uh, uh, a baby. So he doesn't really know where his Cuban heritage 
um, uh, came from or what it means to be half Cuban. So um, uh, my mother, you know, she's now 96 and could live forever, uh, I hope. So um, uh, this was probably, I would say, the closest parallel between Jack and myself. So I made Jack a sole practitioner. Once he moves on from doing death penalty work, he, um, um, he's a sole practitioner. Um, and being a writer is kind of like that, right? You're, it's a very isolated sort of existence. It's one reason I've gone back to practicing law uh, is because it was, um, it was pretty, pretty, pretty lonely at times. Um, this house I've shared with you because this was actually kind of a funny story, right? So um, I went looking in around the criminal courthouse years ago, 15 years ago probably, and thought, okay, well, where would Jack's office be? So this house is still a house, um, but it was actually in one of these old, old, old neighborhoods where it's sort of becoming, you know, everything's turning into cigar shops or wine shops or, um, you know, uh, Pilates studios or what have you, you know. So it's half commercial, half residential. I thought, okay, this looks like, and this was an old house built out of coral stone by Miami pioneer um, Julia Tuttle. Um, and uh, I thought, that's it. That's going to be Jack's place. So I wrote that into, um, I think, a book called Afraid of the Dark. And um, about five years after that, Tiffany and I, she's taking me to a friend's house, one of her friend's house for, um, uh, who was a, she was a ballet dancer at, at Miami City Ballet, and we're going to her house. And, and Tiffany's telling me, okay, turn her, turn her. And I'm like, oh, this is interesting. This is, this is kind of where I would, Jack's house. And then she's like, you know, no, oh, no, turn there. And I'm like, oh, this is the street that Jack's house is. We stop, literally, it turns out, I had never been inside the house, right? And so um, it turns out that her friend owns this house. Um, and the coolest thing was that it really, it was exactly how I imagined it would be inside the house with the, built in the 1920s with the old Dade County Pine floors and all of that. So very strange. Um, uh other parallels yeah i got married jack got engaged at the biltmore hotel i had my wedding reception there that's kind of a stretch um but um jack has a daughter now so right the series has moved on um i've had uh, i have three i have uh, two girls um uh and a son and these are some fun things so i wrote one novel that is um there is a um, Pawtucket Red Sox minor league player is the lead character in the story. And the owner of the team invited us up. So my son got to throw out the first pitch and so forth. I put Ainsley um, in as a character in one of my novels. So she joined me at the book signing at the upper right hand corner. And Kaylee just went off and did her own thing. She became a, a um, ballet dancer um, uh, following her dream. Um, Jack also has a dog, right? And so um, I've shared this because if there are, if you've had any relationship ever with a pet, um, the one thing that I wrote um, probably has been read more than any, anything I've ever written was when um, my golden retriever, Sam, passed away. I wrote the story about a writer's relationship with his, his um, dog. And um, that got picked up by the wire services and went all over the country. And I got thousands of emails um, about that. And in fact, I ended up getting a phone call from a woman in the state of Maine who was crying when she read this story. And she said, you know, whenever you're ready for another pet, another golden retriever, um, let me know. And, and, and so we called her. Um, it took us about a year and a half to be ready to to get another dog and um and uh she said oh i wish you had just called like three weeks ago i have a litter of nine puppies but they're all spoken for 
So I'm like, oh shoot, oh, we'll try again. So she calls me back a day later, crying again, says, I reread your article. Please take the puppy I was gonna keep for myself. Um, and so that's, so that's Max. Um, uh, so we, that's how we, we got Max, uh, who's was a good sport in promoting my novel. So, um, yeah, I mean, the other thing, right, is that, you know, Jack is slowing down in age. I'm not, um, but Jack is probably, I don't know what he's now. He's still in his 40s at this point, probably. But, you know, if you did the math, you'd realize he should be probably a little older than that. Um, and this was the highlight of the series, really. It was the, the Harper Lee Prize went uh, for Jack Switek in a novel called Gone Again. Um, and this is the best, coolest thing about winning that prize is that, so before Harper Lee died, she created this prize um, and she signed only 10 books of um, To Kill a Mockingbird. Um, so the prize is no more. Uh, it, only, it was only available for 10 years, which there were 10 signed books. And so, and you can tell she's old when she signed that, but it's still pretty special to have um, a signed copy of To Kill a Mockingbird by Harper Lee. Um, okay. Um, so let's talk a little bit about, um, I guess, the new book. Um, you know, um, people are always asking, so where do the ideas come from? And, you know, I told you about the near arrest, right? So that's the lightning bolt example. I mean, I would say that's not normal, uh, that suddenly boom, you know, it, it hits you, you know, like a, like a two by four between the eyes, you know, that you've got, uh, you suddenly have an idea and you, it, it's, it's usually, um, more like this, the, the percolator, uh, right? Um, and it can, a story can kind of percolate for years. Um, and that's kind of, the, well, that's not just kind of, that actually is the case with Goodbye Girl. Um, this story first came to me um, is, um, so I got involved in a, uh, a trial in New York City um, over the ownership of EMI records. EMI was like the, I mean, it is the storied record label of, um, of the UK, right? And uh, although it had a lot of Amer American artists, you know, there the list goes on and is starting going back to Sinatra and Judy Garland and Nat King Cole and all the way through, you know, the Beatles, Bob Dylan, Pink Floyd, David Bowie, Mariah Carey, others, um, because they have all these labels, you know, the Capitol Records and Virgin and, and all of that. So, um, so there was this huge trial. Oh, that's just stupid. I'll skip that. Um, so there was this trial after um, a private equity firm bought EMI Records for, for like 5.9 billion euros, um, which I don't know how many dollars that, that is, but it's a lot of money. <laughs> you know, it's a lot of money. Um, and, um, and it turned out that uh, the buyer felt like it was a pig in a poke um, and sued um, and claims that the specific lawsuit was that, you know, uh, that uh, the investment bank who was basically holding the auction allegedly lied to the buyer and said, well, you, you know, there's, all, there's this other buyer and they're going to, you know, it's like, it's almost like buying a house, right? The, uh, that they're always telling you that they, you know, there's, there's something, you know, somebody else is going to come in, you got to up your offer and all of that. Um, anyway, um, this case, we represented the buyer. It was not a great case, right? It was like, this is, this is not, well, I say it's like buying a house. It's not like buying a house. These are sophisticated business people, you know, and really you do your own due diligence and you, you can't just say, oh, I overpaid because some guy said, well, 
you know, Joe Schmo is going to bar, outbid you or something. So this went to trial in the Southern District of New York. Um, it was going to be in London at first, and they moved it to New York. Um, and um, by the way, this is so we uh, I put the earplugs there because so we the trial team stayed in downtown Manhattan for about three weeks for the trial. And it was, um, this was 2010. And it was across the street from where they were building the new um, World Trade Center. And they were determined to finish that building by the 10th anniversary of 9-11. And so it was the only hotel I've ever checked into where they literally gave us earplugs. As they said, at 3.30 in the morning, you're going to hear the construction crew right outside your window. So um, anyway, um, the reason that the buyer felt cheated, or at least like he, he'd overpaid, um, was piracy. Uh, piracy was killing the music industry um, 10, 12 years ago. Right. Um, and probably, I mean, if, if you have an, in this room, you know, somebody who has downloaded music illegally without paying for it. Right. And um, there was this website called Napster that all the kids were going on. Nobody was buying music. The only money in um, uh, in in uh, the music industry was licensing. Like for plays, uh, you know, you delight, you license the play, the music to a, a play or a TV show or a commercial. That was all the profit. But just getting paid for artists, getting paid for their music from consumers wasn't happening. Um, and so I had kind of an inside look at this as a result of the case. And I thought, well, you know, maybe maybe there's a novel in the music piracy thing. Um, but then suddenly things got better. Um, and it almost sort of restores your faith in humanity, right? Because what it turned out that really, if, if you offer a product to people at a fair price, they'll pay for it, right? It's not, not everybody's a thief. Uh, and, and, and it wasn't, so even though everybody was stealing the music, once streaming services came along and you could pay, you know, $9.99 a month or whatever it was and get all the songs you wanted, people were happy with it. And so piracy really plummeted, um, in, uh, you know, 2015, 16, 17 era. And so, so I thought, okay. My piracy idea is dead. This is not relevant anymore. So I shelved it. Uh, you know, I had an outline and everything for a story, but I'm like, you know, it's really just, uh, we've kind of solved that problem. Except now it's back, right? It is, and here's the problem is that, like I said, you know, if you offer people a product at a fair price, they're willing to pay for it. Now, you've got to sign up for like seven different streaming services, right? To, to get all of the shows that you want to see, all the movies you want to see, all the, all the music you want to listen to. And so piracy is back because people are feeling, I, I mean, I can't spend $200 a month on, you know, all of 11 different streaming services uh, for this. And so now it's back in the form of something called stream ripping, which, you know, um, Google it if you want to learn more about it. But that's, you know, the, uh, the days of downloading, you know, files and things, that's, that's old. So now it's called stream ripping. And so I thought, okay, well, you know, turn lemons to lemonade, right? Even though, because my books are pirated, right? I mean, you, there are people reading my books on torrens.com uh, before my books even come out. So it's a problem for every, everybody's industry. Um, and uh, 
No, of course, they're uh, <laughs> by downloading my book on a piracy website, they're also probably giving up all of their personal identity and personal information, but you know, people do it anyway. So I thought, well, well, you know, but what's the story, right? Okay, I got this idea out there about music piracy. Um, what's going to be the story? And so, as I say, sarcastically, as with all of life's problems, Today, the answer comes from Taylor Swift, okay? So, um, and she's a smart woman. Um, so Taylor Swift um, found herself in a very, very bad situation. Um, and um, like most artists, when she started out, the, um, the bulk of her money went to whatever entity it was that owned her master recordings. So, you know, as you, 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 you sign anything, you know, you're trying to break out. And so she signed this deal. So her first six albums were really making a guy named Scooter Braun very rich, but not her. Um, and so um, she said, you know, we, okay, this is ridiculous. This has gone on for six, six albums. We, we need to renegotiate. Um, and so he said, no, you know, <laughs> you know, too bad, so sad. You know, you signed the contract. Uh, life's a bitch. You know, that's the way it goes. So, um, so what she did was, and everybody here has probably heard of, if not, you're, you know, your kids or grandkids have heard about Taylor's version of her songs. She literally went back into the studio and re-recorded all of her six albums, her first six albums. Um, and an interesting thing, and in I, I found out in doing the research for this, Frank Sinatra did the same thing years ago, re-recorded the albums and then told all her fans, buy Taylor's version. And they did. Um, so now Scooter Braun has the, held the uh, rights to the master recordings to her first albums, but everybody's buying Taylor's version, um, which to me is just like a brilliant um, stroke that um, she pulled off, and she did. So, um, but um, what allowed her to do this actually was COVID because she wasn't touring. Um, so she just had all this time on her hand, went into the studio and re-recorded six albums. And so I'm like, okay, so what am I going to do with that? That's really clever. So, um, it came to me. So it was kind of like, right. The percolator, right. Had gone on for years, but that was sort of the lightning bolt with the Taylor Swift thing. So suddenly I'm thinking, okay, this is great. So. Jack has a client like a Taylor Swift, right? Um, and I got to make Scooter an interesting character even worse. So I turned Scooter into um, this uh, fictional pop star, Imani, is married to the guy um, and divorced from him, actually. So, so Scooter is her ex-husband. So, right? So she not only wants to keep him from getting the money, but she would rather, my character, would rather thieves take her money than it go to her ex-husband, right? So she doesn't re-record her albums. She just tells all her fans, go pirate. Just download the music illegally. Um, I don't care. I'm not making any money off these songs anyway. Go pirate. Um, um, so that's where things take off. And of course, um, it starts out as a music piracy case, um, but like in any novel in this genre, somebody ends up dead. Um, and the story sort of takes up from there. So Jack moves from being a lawyer to Imani the pop star to Imani the accused killer. Um, so, um, so that's sort of, uh, it's a fun story, right? And I've gotten really great feedback on it, which is gratifying because, you know, you worry after 30 years, does a series 
still have legs, you know, and so apparently it does. So I also want to share with you just a, you know, quickly a, a, a little bit of a background story about the previous book was called Code 6, which is outside the series. But this was one of the, um, you know, I've, I've, uh, for charity, I always donate um, a character. Uh, in fact, somebody uh, for the Broward Library System um, uh, is a character in Goodbye Girl. Um, this one was different. Um, so that's Patrick Battle. Um, sadly, um, Patrick died when he was 16 years old of cancer. Um, and either, um, I don't know, either out of sympathy or temporary sanity or something, I told his parents I would put him into one of my novels. Um, and so it took like three novels because there's, and if you've read my stuff, there's not a lot of room for a 16 year old boy in the novel. And so, but for this book, the light bulb moment was when I realized, so it was a tech thriller, right? About big data and the loss of our personal identity and stuff. And Patrick was a tech nut, right? Played all the games, all of that. And so the light bulb moment and that process was when I realized, wow, um, I'll age him in real time. And I realized by the time the book comes out, he would have been 21 or 22 years old, which is just the, like, the perfect age for one of these whiz kids, you know, in Silicon Valley to be. And so um, it worked so well that whereas most of the time, I put a character into one of these novels and it's like, you know, they're, you know, Jack runs into them at the coffee shop or something and says hello. And that's the end of it. Patrick ended up in, he's like the third most important character in the book and he's in 35 chapters. Um, and so that, that was um, really gratifying to, to, um, to make that work. Um, and so, um, then the last thing, and then I'll take some questions for y'all, um, uh, is, um, so this was to me, I have my, I, this is my, still I argue with the publicity department at Harper Collins about this, is because they keep saying it's ripped from the headlines, and it's really not. I, I, I mean, I think, you know, ripped from the headlines is like, um, law and order. That's what they, they do. They're, there's a story in the real life and they sort of make it. And what I really do is, I, I, I mean, I sort of look for forces that inevitably are going to collide in the real world and then work it out in um, the novel, which I think more of is being ripped from tomorrow's headlines than ripped from the headlines. Um, um, small point, but I think... Um, it, it makes the novels more fun to read um, because they're forward looking and not just uh, telling of things that have already happened. So um, with that, um, we have a few minutes for some questions if anybody would like to ask. And also if anybody's got to go, I, you know, don't, don't feel like, you know, the bathroom or whatever it is, you know, feel like uh, you have to sit here and yeah. So the question is, how long does it take me to write a novel? And that's a really good question because there's, um, so a book like Code 6 took me two years because it's all new characters and it's a tech thriller, not a legal thriller, right? So, um, but if you're going to write, um, if I'm going to write another Jack Switek novel, which is a, a legal thriller, first of all, that saves you about four months of work, not having to create the cast you know, who they are, where they've been, where they're going. So I can write a Jack Switek novel. Now, when you say how long to write, assuming I have the outline done from the day I start writing till I deliver it in about six months. Which you have to be on that schedule now because that's pretty much the minimum expect expectation is that you'll have um, a book a year. Um, someone was telling me Stuart Woods was doing four a year by the, before he died, which, um, yeah, well, I guess that's, there's that component to it also. Yeah. So, yeah. 
So it's just one. Does um, anybody here remember Tim Dorsey? So Tim Dorsey was sort of a Carl Hyacinth style writer. And whenever he was asked that question, I'm going to answer a little snidely because Tim's passed away. He was a great friend. Um, whenever he was asked, you know, is there anything, you know, anything in Hollywood, you know, and he'd say, well, I'm happy to tell you, I've just signed a deal with HBO for 1999. I get all the movies that I want to watch. <laughs> so that's my nod to Tim. But yeah, there's always, there's always something percolating in that realm, but I, you know, tell my agent, to call me when it's time to pop the popcorn, you know? So, yeah. Yeah. What authors do you enjoy reading? Do you have time? Yeah. So, well, um, if I could give you, um, you know, that's, that's a hard one because, so in the genre, it's limited because it's easy for me to slip into feeling like I'm doing work. If I read a thriller, you know, I'm looking at the devices they're using to keep the pages turning and all that. Um, and, um, uh, so I like Michael Connolly a lot, um, and who actually started out as a crime reporter in South Florida. Um, now I obviously huge success with the Lincoln lawyer and Bosch and so forth. Um, uh, and then, um, God, I'm drawing a, 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 a blank on his name now for just, uh, talking too much, but he wrote a book called Paranoia, uh, which was like a, became a movie. Um, oh, it'll come to me and I'll mention it to you. Those two I would mention, um, but, um, yeah, Linda Fairstein, I like a lot also. I think she's a former prosecutor. I don't think she's writing in bar though, but her books with, um, Alex Cooper, the prosecutor are very, very good. Do you have, um, students that want to follow your there's always one student. She asked, are there students who want to follow in the path? I teach law and literature at the University of Miami, um, which has been a really eye-opening experience. You know, for example, you know, uh, it makes me realize how dated my cultural references are in my stories or in my classes. Also, I mean, I, I, I mean to me, the original legal thriller is um, Mutiny on the Bounty. And if you think about the book, right, that's all, it's these great courtroom scenes um, uh, at the end of that book. Um, and I started talking about that in my class and I was getting these blank stares. Correct, man, I'm like, um, Mutiny on the Bounty, so Fletcher Christian, you know, Captain Bly, and they're like, never heard of it, never heard of it, you know, and so, um, so, but yeah, there's always, I would say on average, there's one student in the class who takes that class because they're thinking about becoming a writer. Um, most people take it because I'm an easy grader, I think. So, yeah. yeah. How do you come up with the names for your characters? To, I come up with the names. He wants to know how you come up with the names for the character. So obviously there's one that's you know, not, I have no input into, and that's the, the auctions name right and and so um i think the one the only thing way to answer that question is that for sure you don't want it to be a name people are going to trip over um on it and also i've just you know i mean these are just kind of um uh y y well so and then there are names that pop into your head for bad reasons you know i had uh, my first novel i wrote there's a character I named it. Oh, uh, then for some reason the name Michael Bianchi stuck in my in my head, and like, okay, I'll put that in there. And then like three weeks later, I realized that he was the Hillside Strangler, you know. And I'm like, okay, that's not going to work, you know. So, so, um, but yeah, you want it to be something that sort of sounds like it's written, right? And so that people aren't tripping over it. I think is the main thing. Yeah. Yeah, well, I mean, I, I'm a graduate of the University of Florida, and my wife's a graduate of Florida State, so I guess there's, there's, so I guess there's that, you know. But it, you know, um, but I have not, um, I, I have not known um, a um, 
a criminal defense lawyer who's married to an FBI agent. But that I think that makes for some rich, you know, in, interaction between the two, which is fun. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay, so we do have books over here if you're interested, and I'll be happy to sign them for you. Um, and please tell your friends I'll be at Books and Books Friday.